So our first speaker is Enrique um, Kurt Kurtzer, who's uh, well known, well recognized, and one of the top uh, numerical modeling experts in the world. And he's going to talk about regional and global ramifications of boundary current upwelling. Let's give a warm welcome for Enrique. <laughs> Am I on that? Yeah. Um, well, thank you for the invitation to, to come to this meeting and, and, and to come to Boulder. It's always a, a real treat um, to come here. And for those of you that, um, that know me, I, I tend to spend um, my summers here for the last 11 or 12 years. I usually have the main side and car. Except this summer, um, there was no plan to come. Uh, we're going to do something different. And um, so this invitation came out a little bit. It's great. I get to come and, and visit and um, get a little taste of Boulder. Um, and I like it so much here that um, what I'm going to talk about today is really um, what I used to call my, my summer hobby. Um, I was living in New York City, and I had to get out for the summers, and I thought, oh, Boulder would be nice. And I um, came here to do a little bit of work with the people up in NCAR for a couple of weeks at a time, and one of those lunchtime conversations uh, led to what uh, has become a significant part of the work that, I, that I'm doing. And what you're looking at here is uh, two model simulations. So I, I tend to work on regional scales in the ocean. Um, we all know about the global climate system. But there, there's significant problems um, in these models and how they represent coastal, coastal regions. And there's, there's some, some good reasons why we want to do better in them. And these are the kinds of scales that I work in. Here is a California current model uh, that we do. Um, and here's the North East Atlantic model. And what I'm going to talk today is, is mostly about upwelling systems, which are, tend to be the eastern boundary currents. There's, there's upwelling also in western boundary currents, but in eastern boundary currents, that's the part that really dominates um, our, our understanding of the dynamics and the physics of, of, um, of these models. So um, the work that uh, the results I'm going to show you are the results of, of um, well, the work that we've been doing over the years um, with people um, up at NCAR um, and, and some collaborators, uh, both at NOAA here, um, also in Boulder, Colorado, and um, an and old colleague at the University of Alaska. So I don't know where who's better to stand. Um, I'll stand here. Um, so I'm going to give you, so these are the eastern boundary currents, um, the, the three of the most prominent ones. There's other ones, there's a canary current, and there's other systems as well. But here we have the California, the Peru system, um, and the Benguela system off the coast of, uh, of Africa. Um, I'm going to talk, give a little bit of motivation why we're interested in this and why the particular approach that, um, that um, I'm taking in, in trying to model uh, these currents within the global climate system. Um, I'm going to talk about implementations, uh, two particular implementations in the California and the Benguela system, and um, some summary remarks. And uh, I understand this is a diverse audience. Um, I wasn't quite sure what to expect, but I think I have enough um, motivation in there for if you don't quite get all the details, might always stop me at any point that you need to. Um, you you um, hopefully understand why, why it is that we're doing this. So why is it that we are interested in doing regional models or looking at regional impacts, right? So you can go back about 40 years to the first climate simulations that Jim Hansen did and, and Suki Manabi at GFDL and Hansen at, um, at, at NASA. And they did a back of the envelope calculation that said if you double CO2, you're going to get 2 to 4 degrees warm. 40 years later, or 50 years later, almost with models, IPCC, what are we, AR5, and moving on and on and on, the answer is still the same. It's not that we haven't learned anything about it, right? We've learned a lot. We we're reducing the uncertainty in these models. We have a much better understanding of how the climate system is working, right? But basically, we know what the answer is, right? The solution is not going to be a scientific solution at this point. It's going to be a political, social solution, right? But there's still a lot of room in understanding. These models were designed to look at the global climate. The next phase for us is to understand the regional impacts and what we need to, how the climate is going to affect particular areas, what, is, what are the adaptation that different regions will have to take in terms of, of um, responding to, to the forcing that we're adding. So, so there's the question of, of regional impacts, as I just said, and the need to improve. So our understanding how weather and climate is connected is the next hurricane that's going to hit us. Is it really because of climate? Is the fire up in Canada because of climate change or not? Or what is the contribution of climate to that kind of 
um, to that kind of uh, shorter scale, uh, time scale um, phenomena that, that we observe. So climate model biases, I'm going to talk a little bit about that. Another really interesting problem is that if you look at these global climate models, they do generally fairly well, except, as I will show you, in, in regions, um, coastal regions. So trying to understand what is missing from those models and how we might be able to um, to improve upon them is uh, part of the motivation here. And um, also ecosystems. Um, not only are these coastal regions important in terms of the physical climate, it's also where all your fisheries are. A significant amount of the protein in the world comes from, from eastern boundary um, sardine and anchovy populations or other small projects that, that are in the ocean. So trying to understand how these models are, are doing and linking it to, um, to ecosystems um, ultimately is of significant importance. So here is a, a picture um, that uh, if you were if you were in oceanography you would have seen many, many variations of this before. Um, it shows you here you have um, temporal scales, so it's based on temporal and spatial scales, and you go from the climate system to on, on the planetary scale and or order hundred years or more down to turbulent patches, molecular processes. And all these scales are there in the ocean. And this is the big challenge that we face. How do we model turbulent patches in terms of a climate context, right? So we have many, many scales that we have to cover. If you look at most of our models, this is the phase that they live in. Even our high resolution, you know, eye popping, beautiful results that I showed you before, at best they're beginning to resolve some eddies and some fronts. So maybe order 10 kilometers and maybe a month or so, right? We still have a lot of phenomena here on, on turbulence, running your cells, biological processes that we are not resolving at all. So, oops, wrong button. So, there's still a lot to explore in terms of how these things are. So, one of the things that we talk about is downscaling. So, what we do is we take information from the climate system, large scale climate global models, and we try to bring it down to maybe a regional model that can then start resolving even if for short periods of time, some of the processes that we we're interested in. And what I'm going to talk about today a little bit is to try to convince you that there's a two-way feedback between this. So it's not just that we need to understand how the climate system is driving these smaller scale processes, but it's the feedback, right? The smaller scale processes that eventually ultimately form the dynamics that contribute to, to climate. Or at least we've got to convince ourselves that they're not important. So, Continuing on in terms of motivation, here's a um, looking at the biases of these climate models. You are looking at a long simulation that was done here at NCAR some, some years ago now. This is CCSN 3.5, and this is um, the anomaly relative to, to our observational data, so our climatology. And what you see that, um, that you run this for a long period of time, and you see that the models generally do pretty well. This is your global ocean model, except right in the regions of the eastern boundary and western boundary currents, right? This is, of course, where most of the people on Earth live. This is where our ecosystems live. So the global climate models are great, except if you really care what's happening locally in those areas, right? So this is like a significant motivation that we, we are aware of it, right? It's been there for a while. It's not been solved. Turns out that cranking up the resolution doesn't always help you, um, so there's a lot of work to, to still be done here. So, too warm, too cold. If you look at, I think this was from AR4, um, the lead, um, lead author Randall, um, chapter one, um, you know, the, there's an admission that there's significant errors in these models. And there's always this assumption that as you go to higher resolution, you're going to get rid of them. So our computers will become bigger, um, we'll run at higher resolution, and we don't have to worry about it so much. I, I'm going to put it to you that uh, there, there's some truth to that, but there's a lot more going on. Okay, ecosystems. I always have to throw a fish, um, a fish story in there. This is, a, this is, you're looking here at fluctuations of sardine and anchovies over decades. This is going back to about 1920. And here you have the California system, Japan, which is a western undercurrent. You have Peru, you have, um, you have um, the Benguela system. And you see this amazing low frequency variability of this fluctuation of these populations in sardine and anchovy. And you also see this kind of tantalizing synchrony between the systems, Benguela and the Atlantic being out of phase, but 
still there's this incredible synchrony between all the systems, right? So you have these long time scales the, over, over which these populations are going up and down. And on the right, what you're looking at here is the distribution of eggs in the California current for, uh, for sardine. And what you're beginning to see here is, is sort of the, the interplay between the, the biology and the physics, because you're looking at turtle and patches there, you're looking at eddies in the ocean. And the question is, what role do these kind of mesoscale, that is, this is two different years, so you're seeing this significant interannual variability, and the question is, what role does do this scale of spatial processes ultimately play in the long-term um, population dynamics, if you will, of this particular uh, few species? Um, this problem has been with us uh, for a long time. Um, if you ever read Simon Cannery role, you know, it was, it was a describing this collapse of the serene populations here. At the time, we thought it was all done because of overfishing. Now we know that, well, probably that wasn't the only cause of it. Um, but trying to understand this, this, this spatial and temporal links is uh, uh, we have not figured that out yet. Okay, so um, how, how do I think about these things? Um, we're thinking about small time scales and small spatial scales and, and much longer periods. So the way that we've been approaching things is we, we start with a global climate model that gives us the background, and then we try to maybe downscale it and two-way downscale it to, to a regional model that can start to resolve these this turbulent processes that we think may be ultimately important, and then we can link then these models to, uh, to perhaps some concentration-based um, nutrient cycling models, so your nitrate and your carbon and whatever else you need. And then we can even link to these um, ultimately fish models. So we actually have fish and, and, and boats swimming in our models and, and trying to understand how all these things are linked together and what are the feedbacks between all those potential systems. Um, a little bit of an aside, um, so we would, I'm going to jump now to some results looking at, um, at this bias problem. So this is the same picture. There's, I'm going to show you once where we enhancing the resolution of the ocean, but there's other ways to approach it. Um, one of them is, for example, increasing the, uh, the atmospheric resolution. So here is your classical two degree global model and what happens when you bring it up to a half degree. And what you can see that in some places, for example, especially in the Peru, Chile, you get a significant improvement. This is from a Peter Jan paper um, a few years ago now. Uh, basically, if you can resolve holographic effects, the Andes, you will improve that representation of that particular system. However, there's still problems that remain in other places. So it's not the only issue. Um, you can improve how the Earth sea fluxes are computed. And then there's the work that we've been carrying out, which is uh, trying to increase the ocean resolution and try to understand what is the role of the ocean in the dynamics of this um, eastern boundary systems. So the way we go about it here is a, a schematic of what the NCAR, um, or for that matter, most climate models look like. You have a flux coupler that sits at the middle of, of all these different components. So you have the atmospheric model, the land model, the sea ice model, and you have an ocean model. Um, and then each of these models computes its own state and for about a day or so roughly, and then you pass it to the coupler, and then the coupler computes all the different um, all the fluxes that, that go back and forth between these different systems. What we have done some years ago is we, we, we took up the ocean, we put in a new layer that allows you to have both the global model and the regional model around. So I don't know if you can see that well. Um, and we so built in this new driver that communicates between the two. Okay, programming nightmare, but you know we, we, we do this. Uh, we do this regularly now. Um, the picture maybe is a better way to do this. Um, you have here your global ocean model, and we, we put down uh, a, a region where we want to run a higher resolution uh, regional model that we've worked with before. Um, this extracts boundary conditions. We compute then this, and every day then it gets together, and we form a new surface, global surface temperature um, um, yield, but then that gets passed back to the flux coupler in the atmosphere, never knew where it came from, right? But, so this is kind of what's happening. Um, we are running this, um, we started with kind of variability, variability type simulations. Um, so we have a baseline simulation, we run this for 150 years, we branch it from an 1870 control run, so this is, if you're not familiar with the climate parlance, this is for you typical baseline simulation, and then we run the composite, so we run another 150 years where we have this, this composite um, pop and, and, and ROM solution and all the other standard components of the climate model. 
and then we do t-test. And, and there's a very important point here. You can think of this uh, high-resolution model as introducing a perturbation uh, to your global model, right? So we are all of a sudden, we are resolving upwelling. You have colder water that wasn't there before. How do we separate the impact of that particular cold patch from the natural variability. These are nonlinear models. If you run these models for about a thousand years or fifteen hundred years like Ankar has done, and you let's say break it up into ten year periods and you start taking differences, you will see a lot of variability in there, right? The model is nonlinear. Now you're going to introduce a perturbation. You kind of pick that a little bit, and you're going to get a response. And how do you separate that response that's due to that from the natural variability of the system? That's a very, very uh, subtle and important point to carry out. And by the way, that's why we run for like over 100 years. It takes us that, about that long to get statistical significance. So we do that, and wherever you see these little dots here, are, that's where we have 95% statistical significance that what we are looking at is actually a difference due to the perturbation we introduce as opposed to natural variability of the system. So what you're looking at here is now uh, temperatures average over the last 140 years of the simulation for June, July, August, September, October, November, winter months, spring months, and this is the difference. So we average them for those 140 years, and then we sort of break them up um, into 10-year periods, and we do this t-test to, to, to separate out um, the natural variability from the forced response, and this is what we get. So what you see that we can indeed start addressing. We can get in the summer months, these are the upwelling months, um, in the California current, we can get um, something that's two to three degrees. I think I neglected to say, if you look at the bias pictures I showed you before, the biases can be eight to ten degrees too warm, right? These models are really, really off when they are off. Um, so we're not recovering the whole signal here, but we're recovering some of it. Um, Basically, I'm going to go quickly through this. We then can diagnose what's happening. Let me see how we're doing time. Okay, I have about 10 minutes or five minutes. Um, here is the two, the two degree too cool, and then we look at the fluxes, and we have basically that. What that does is it leads to to an increase in the low clouds, and then you go show irradiation decreases one wave radiation, all this, and the final result is that it actually leads to an increase in the total heat flux into the ocean. It's a little bit counterintuitive, right? But if you make the water cooler, what that's going to cause is it's going to cause more heat to go into the ocean, right? So what this is basically telling you is that you have a coupled response. If you're, gonna, if you're interested in what the upwelling system is going to be in the future, you cannot simply take some future scenario and and ignore the couple feedback. So the couple feedbacks are very, very, very important in this system, right? You will overestimate what the upwelling would be if you ignore the damping, res the damping response from this increase in heat into the ocean, okay? Um, upscaling. So I told you initially before that you have to look what the feedback is to the global system, not just locally, right? So you're looking here now at the air surface temperature. So this is the two meter temperature coming out of the model. Again, where you have the dots is significant statistical significance. None there, some here. And what you see again, it's not a very big number, but we are actually cooling over North America by about, you know, a quarter to a half degree Celsius over 140 years. So there is a feedback to a larger scale system. Okay, so we thought we learned a lot. I'm going to go quickly now because I think I only have about three or four minutes. Um, so we said, let's try this in the Benguela system, right? It's another system that the models have a really, really hard time um, doing well. And you can see here why. These are upwelling cells um, of the west coast of Africa. And you see this is a very small scale features um, and a very complicated current structure with, with polar undercurrents and surface currents and, and temperature fronts here, the Benguela. Angola Benguela font right there. Um, this is from the paper we just did, Journal of Climate, came out this last December. So we said, oh, you know what we're doing, right? We're going to plot it, put down a really high resolution ocean model in there, we're going to run it again, and we're going to do better, right? We're going to get two to three degrees. Well, guess what happened? Here's the bias. We made it worse. We made it warmer. <laughs> right? We actually put in higher resolution, we resolved some of the things, we did it warmer. This is a head scratcher, right? So again, um, you cannot blindly just throw resolution at things and expect good things to happen. <laughs> Very important lesson. So we went through this whole exercise. Um, here, I'm going to skip this in, in terms of time. So here is that, that warming. 
then we said, oh, let's increase the atmospheric resolution. So we went from a one degree atmosphere to a half degree atmosphere. Um, we made it a little bit better, but still too warm. So then we started looking at how actually this interpolation is happening between the between the, the winds, the global winds, and the ocean. And it turns out that, that atmospheric scientists and ocean scientists don't always talk. <laughs> we, we, we need a flux couple between the scientists as much as between the fields, right? They're grids. You can have an atmospheric cell, right, that will be partly over the ocean and partly over land, right? And you have two different boundary layers things that happen, right? So when you're actually interpolating, and if this upwelling is very, very sensitive to the wind stress right at the coast, right? You have no idea when you're applying it whether it's coming from mostly land or mostly ocean, right? This is something there's a lot yet to be done even at the low resolutions. So what we did is we said, okay, we're going to make sure that whatever wind we are applying here, we're actually going to be dragging it from a cell, an atmospheric cell that sits purely over the ocean. So we shifted the winds a little bit, right? So we, I like to say we got clever in our interpolations. And lo and behold, you see what happens. This is not stronger wind. It's not higher resolution, it's this resolution, right? It's just the way that interpolation got done. So we do that and, and we, can get, um, we can get a much nicer response. And here's two, two cross sections, so you see what the ocean, this is what it was before. This, so this is the half degree atmosphere, here's what the temperature structure looks like. And then once we shift to the winds, you see that we can start getting these upwelling. Here is your upwelling, the deeper, cooler water is reaching the surface it's in a very, very narrow band. And the only difference between these two simulations is the way the atmosphere was interpolated onto it. Of course, you also need the ocean resolution to be able to resolve those problems, right? So it's not that you didn't need the high ocean resolution, you needed it, but that was only part of the story. Um, I'm going to go quickly. Um, basically, I think I only have a minute or two. I just want to talk um, quickly about ecosystems, and here is, uh, we ran back to the California current, and we did the simulations um, with a carbon cycle in it, and here's what we learned. Here's a, a, an ocean model at 30 kilometer resolution, at 10 kilometer resolution, and 3 kilometer resolution, and we're looking at the outgassing, so the earth sea CO2 exchange, right? So this is, again, important for climate. The red line here, is the CO2 outgassing limit. So if, you, if you're in any line of latitude and you begin to go west, right, so you're, you're outgassing CO2 to the atmosphere. And then the blue line here is the equilibrium line. So when you get to that point and you integrate across, you end up with a net zero CO2 exchange between the ocean and the atmosphere, right? So it's one way to look at this. And, and here's what you see. If you're running it at, the, at, at 30 kilometer resolution, which is still better than most climate models nowadays, which are running at one degree for about 100 kilometer resolution, you see that the California current is a net outgassing. But once you start going to, the res to, to higher resolutions, um, that kind of goes away. Here are some observations um, somewhere in the California current and these little dots. And here is, you see that, that the 30 kilometer model, right, this red line, grossly overestimates the source of CO2 coming out of this upwelling region, California current. Um, and, and once we go down to 10 kilometer resolution, we do much better relative to the data that we have. And then going from 10 to 3, maybe we're getting some of the details better, but the basic characteristic of it remains the same. Okay? So when you bring in an ecosystem consideration, uh, it may give you a different answer to what is the resolution that you need or what are the features that you need to resolve. So depending on the question that you're asking, right, you might, you might um, approach the problem a little bit different. That's perhaps not surprising. So um, some final remarks to, to close this. Um, <coughs> Upwelling is a couple of phenomena. And um, especially if, you, if you're interested in, in, in making future projections, um, you have to consider all the feedbacks in the system. And the ocean atmosphere feedbacks are very, very significant. And if you ignore them, you do it at, at your own risk. Um, there's cloud feedback, so all these things that you can read by yourself. Um, one of the things that we learn is that the dynamics of plowing is a very generic term. We tend to think of it in terms of, of like you blow the wind, you know, the earth is rotating, the water moves to the right, you bring water up. It turns out that the dynamics, once you start looking at the details of this in the different systems, California, Peru, and well, uh, um, the, 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 there's different things that matter. I mean, yes, the basics are, are correct, but the strength of the upwelling relative to the horizontal advection will make a very big difference in what the final um, product that you're looking at looks like. Um, <coughs> ocean dynamics is important, 
and resolution is not the only fix, but you do need that. And the Venezuela was a good example how you need both atmosphere and ocean resolution to, to address certain problems. Um, <coughs> and then um, we, we're doing similar things in the Western boundary current, I'm not talking about that. And one, one, final, one final thought um, I'll finish with is um, we can't wait for the, for, for the high resolution global models. The computers, um, and this is perhaps a good group to, to discuss this with, computers are getting more powerful, they're not getting faster. And for our kinds of problems, it's a real big challenge, right? So they're actually getting slower, right? I mean, I just put a small cluster, uh, and it's each core is a little bit slower than the ones that I bought three years ago because they had to slow, they couldn't cram more into them, they had to slow down, you know, the clock speeds on them, right? Um, if you have, 360, if you have a one degree model, you have 360 points in your latitude. You cannot put more than 360 processors in that 